Perfect. Well, welcome back, everybody. Hope you all had a nice break, whether that was grabbing a cup of coffee or lunch or maybe even a midnight snack. Um, my name is Christy Morris. I work for the National Park Service Air Resources Division in Denver. And this is the second of two uh, sessions on mercury. Uh, session five, Advances in Mercury Monitoring and Research. And our first speaker is Sandy Steffen from the Environmental Climate Change. Did I say that right? Environmental yeah. Climate? No. <laughs> Environment, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Canada. I know it's a yeah, mouthful. I yeah. got it. I wrote down oh, yeah. all, the, all the letters. So Sandy's going to talk to us today about passive air sampling for mercury, a newer approach to monitoring. Okay, thanks. I'm going to, oh, is this the right direction for this? No. Yeah, there. Am I looking at the screen? No. Yes, you are. Okay, good, good. Okay, because I've got multiple screens here at home. And uh, I just put on my headphones because I um I wasn't sure if everyone, like, it, anyway, I put the headphones on. Okay, so um, I'm going to sort of switch gears a little bit from these wonderful scientific studies that have great research results that I've been vigorously writing things down to, to a bit more of a high level kind of, let's let's really have this discussion. I kind of wanted to do it in the vein of the idea of, of change that uh, NADP is, you know, the theme of this is sort of the changing community, changing environment, life is changing for a lot of us these days. So let's see how we can apply that to um, air monitoring. Sorry, I just saw a squirrel fly out uh, in my peripheral vision. It was kind of funny. So the work I'm gonna present is, uh, is done um, at Environment and Climate Change Canada. Uh, Jeff Steppel, who works with me, uh, has done the majority of this work. Uh, and we've been collaborating a lot with Frank Vanya at the University of Toronto. I'll also be presenting some uh, results from a paper that the group below has done. So I just wanted to acknowledge this uh, hardworking team um, who have really put together quite, a, quite an amazing study. So impetus here is, um, we need to maintain air monitoring. It's really important because if you look in Canada, we have quite a variety of what our trends are telling us. And we actually, especially, uh, we've been looking a lot at our long-term trends, like our alert trend is over 20 years old, I think almost 25 years old. And um, we're seeing changes in those trends. So uh, we're not changing uh, our need for air monitoring. Uh, in particular in Canada, we are a net recipient of mercury, and I'm sure I've said this and I'll say it for years, well over 95% of anthropogenic mercury deposited in Canada comes from outside of Canada. So it's really important for us um, in Canada to, to continue with our air monitoring programs. Um, but, you know, as the philosopher says, change is the only constant in, in our lives these days. So we have to consider what, there's a lot of things driving change uh, and, and what impacts monitoring of mercury, specifically atmospheric monitoring. We've all talked about the Minimatic Convention and that's really starting to have quite a significant impact on our thinking and where we're going. There's a lot of new methodology that's been developed. We had great presentations all today uh, demonstrating the new technologies. The new information coming from everything is changing also how how we need to um, look at our monitoring, like the isotope stuff, for example, like that's just such a great tool that we need to new, really dig into to, to look at our monitoring strategies. Climate change, obviously, funding availability, um, that's changing how we have to do monitoring. Politics is, uh, is having, unfortunately, quite a big impact on things. Hopefully some things are gonna change. Um, and the old guard is actually changing over and I actually consider myself part of part of the old guard. Um, so the, the newer generation is coming in, they're, they're in, in, enthusiastic and ready to start embracing sort of these new technologies and I think that's that's a really good thing. And also our priorities are changing, um, especially in lieu of our nasty little coven that's changing uh, whether we wanted it or not, it's been changing a lot of how, how we do our work. So as I say, changes in the air in Canada, this, we did our national science assessment. This is a uh, really, it looks like Canada is doing so well in our monitoring, but the state right now is that we've shut down a lot of our sites. 
And it's, it's due to a variety of reasons. It's not just due to funding, the funding's one, it's due to political um, priorities. It's also due to capacity in Canada. So, you know, we're, so it's changed, but then, then priorities and capacity changed. So we started our passive air sampling and you can see we're filling in in the North, a lot of our gaps. So change isn't always a bad thing. In terms of global change, um, this is what, looked once pretty good, especially for Canada and the US. Uh, there's obviously a lot of gaps elsewhere. Um, and this is sort of the uh, active air monitoring that was put in the, the global report. But when I really went and looked into what's active now, this is this is what I actually found in terms of what are where are actual sites of active air monitoring for Mercury are. So, we actually do need to fill in the gaps. We need a little bit of help to, to maybe get back to when we looked pretty good. So this is where my call is time for some passive sampling. It's not the only way, it's just one way that I'm, I'm bringing forward. And most of this is because um, we developed this passive air sampler at the University of Toronto. It was Dave McLagan's, oh, I spelt his name wrong. It's L-A-G-A-N, um, sorry about that. Um, and, this is a, it's, it's a relatively simple, simple setup. It's a uh, carbon, a sulfur impregnated carbon. That's the sorbent that gets put into this nice little tube. The tube is put into a diffusive barrier or in yellow, which you're all familiar with. And then we plunk these things outside in what Eric always calls the Noxema case. And so it was, a lot of work was done in this and then uh, it actually, has now become commercially available and is available as something called the MERPAS, which is what TechGran calls it. So this is my, I, I'm always like all about plain language and simple. So that's the way I describe it. This is the way the true experts describe it. It's, um, you know, here's here's the setup of the whole thing you've got. It's, it's the outside part coming into the diffusive barriers through turbulent airflow. And then once you get into that, you're, you're limited by molecular diffusion, and then you've got that uptake in, in the carbon. So um, after, after it comes out and it's been sampled, it gets analyzed through combustion and into an uh, atomic, uh, atomic absorption spectrometer, one of many different instruments. So a lot of research went into developing this and it's proven that it demonstrates quite well. So again, why use passive air sampling? It's less expensive, although we've spent a lot of money on our global program, so I'm not sure how less expensive it truly is. It's, it's easy to use. It's easy to transport. You don't need electricity. You don't need gases. You really don't need any uh, high quality person to do it. Anyone can go out and put it out. You can do lots of deployments, you can do remote sampling. Um, but there, there are limitations to it. Absolutely no doubt about it. There's limitations to it. So it depends on what science question you want. So the big science question that I'm working on is really to do with the Minimatic Convention on Mercury and filling those global gaps. So as we know, the convention came into force. We've had a few conference of the party meetings or COP meetings. The next one's coming up in 2021. And part of the, the focus right now that we're working on with the Minimatic Convention is developing a guidance and developing a framework in which we can have a global monitoring plan and if we if we were, were successful we'd have a program but right now it's a plan and there's a lot of guidance uh, being sought by the Minimatic Convention to the scientific experts to really help them through how to do this and so we had an expert group come together put together a framework and that framework was based on four policy questions and the one that relates to the monitoring here is have the changes in the environment, uh, in the emissions and releases, can we see those reflected in the changes in environment? And for those of us who are in the atmospheric monitoring world, that's where our monitoring comes in. So to address this, we wanted to have a global network. That was, there's really little appetite in the, in the policy community and in the funding community for this. So the second thought that we had was fill it with a network of networks and then do passive air sampling, combination of passive air sampling, active air sampling, and all the different techniques that everyone uses, combine them all together and fill all these gaps. And our, our idea was to initiate a pilot study 
uh, to demonstrate the proof of concept to use these passive samplers we developed uh, within a combination of different networks. So how it works is we basically take the, this MERPAS sampler, we send them out, they're duplicate samples put up for three months. There's a, there's a, a blank that goes with it. And this is all Jeff's baby. He's, he's completely developed how to do this and it's just worked really effectively. We send them out in these buckets and, and they've worked really well. So we've sent them out and they've come back. So right now here are the sites that we have. This is just for my program. So we have 55 sites altogether. We've had about 285 samplers deployed and we have about 200 of them sitting in the lab. So the idea was I was hiring a postdoc. She was coming in April and um, she was gonna analyze them and I'd have all these lovely results for you guys at the, the fall meeting. But as we know, our little force of change came into play. And actually I feel like my my, my samples are being held hostage at my lab because I actually have not been allowed back in the lab since March, nor has Jeff. So we haven't been able to even send these to TechGran for analysis, which is what we're hoping to do because we're not allowed to work on our lab. So um, I have no results to show to you. So I'm a little, you know, sheepishly coming to you and saying I was going to, I was promising nice results last year and yet I have nothing to show for it this year, except a lot of frustration and a bunch of samples in my lab. However, not all is lost because with, with change sometimes comes opportunity and therefore we had the chance to sit down and do a, a big analysis on a, on a project that we were working on in 2019, which was this field in a comparison for three different types of passive samplers. So, um, we were collaborating with two separate groups, one from Italy at CNR, one from IVL in Sweden, and then our MERPAS, so between U of T and uh, TechGran here in Canada. So I call them the Italian, Swedish, and Canadian samplers. And there are three different types of samplers that have been developed by each of these institutes um, for exactly the same purpose of monitoring atmospheric mercury um, on a long-term basis to get spatial and temporal trend information. And these are what each of the samplers look like. So I'm just gonna give you a little brief overview because I have about four more minutes, uh, a little brief overview of how we set up this study and what the major findings were of this, of this inner comparison. So, um, Here's, here's what the Toronto setup looked like. So we had these three samplers at two different sites. So one, the whole system was set up in Rend in Italy, and then the whole system was set up in Toronto outside our building um, in Canada. So we, have, we had 11 different types of deployments. And so altogether 22 deployments. You could see the blue here, it shows you, you had had the, you know, a bunch of two week periods, a bunch of four week periods, a bunch of six week periods, and then one for the whole time period. And those were repeated at the same time at each site. Um, at both sites, we had active TechRan Mercury monitoring so that we can also have that uh, gauge. Uh, and then we blindly submitted our data. So we didn't even look at the, the TechRan data. So we had the TechRan data completely separated from the passive air data and we didn't until we sent all the data to David who graciously accepted to be our gatekeeper and didn't allow anyone to cheat. Um, we didn't even in, in Toronto ourselves we didn't look at our data as compared to the, the, the TechGrand data so it was a really a, a well done blind study. And so then once it was all sent to David he then distributed it all to the three groups and we all started doing our analysis. And so the data was used to look at obviously concentration data, uh, detection limits, accuracy, bias, analytical and sampling precision, and basically uptake sampling rates, the whole thing. It was, it's a very long paper, uh, but it's really nicely done and really goes to in depth. And I have to credit um, the Italians for initiating this and especially Frank Vanya because he really, really did a very good job on constraining and, and keeping us all in line as to what, how to really do this beautifully. So uh, it's, it's a really nice study and I think we're gonna be submitting the paper shortly. So I'm excited about that. So just some details on the three different methods. So I don't like, 
acronyms and all these sort of things. So I'm going to say Italian, Swedish, and Canadian. The design principle for the Italian and Swedish were those discs you saw, and then those really rely on what we call axial diffusion. So it's sort of a one-way diffusion. The difference here between those two and the MERPAS, as you saw, we had a tube, so that was radial diffusion. So you get more collection coming from all the way around versus just sort of the one way. The sorbent material for the Italians is this titanium dioxide, and that is, uh, the gold is, I think, sputtered onto that, and it's a big mesh. And then that, so that's not destroyed. It's basically just the mercury is trapped on that and then gets heated off and then you can reuse it. Whereas the IVL uses a carbon that's impregnated with iodine, we use a sulfur impregnated carbon. So the Swedish and the Canadian ones are basically you collect it on a carbon and you destroy the carbon through combustion or acid digestion. Both of those are the two methods. And then you have to use different carbon for the next sample. So they're not really use, reusable in that manner, although the housing and everything is reusable. So um, all of them use principle of cold vapor atomic. Um, oh, now these two are cold vapor atomic fluorescent spectroscopy because they, they basically either go through the Tecran 2537 or go through the Tecran 2500. Whereas ours, you just basically pour it in a, in a boat and put it into one of the, uh, like a DMA or milestone, a DMA or a, or a Nippon instrument and use combustion and then AA. So the real thing that differentiates the, the Canadian from the, um, the other two is because of the, the, the makeup of the whole thing or the design, we have a higher sampling rate and that sort of proved to to be very efficient um, in, in this technology, whereas the sampling rate for the other two are tend to be quite significantly lower. So here are the summary of the key metrics that we investigated, basically limits of detection, method detection limit, limit of quantification, our precision, and then the bias, so the accuracy of the whole thing, and then the linear uptake. So, Great points. They all showed ex excellent linearity over a range of sam uh, sample concentrations. So we're really pleased about that. Um, the sampling rate for the Italian and the, and the Swedish were very similar at both of those locations. So because of the design, again, their sampling rates are very similar and they have similar performance. So um, because the designs are much more similar, ours is a very different design. Uh, and the, the Italian one seemed to have this, the, the smallest bias here um, versus discrepancy, but they had the smallest bias uh, with the tech brand. But when you look at the discrepancy, um, that sort of shifted towards. So, but the, the MERPAS itself is quite consistent in, in all this. Um, we, had a, we had a bit of an issue where all samplers actually perform, all three samplers perform better in Italy than they did in Canada. I don't know if they just didn't like the Canadian winter or if we, we may have had a local source that was providing a little bit of hiccups. We're not sure, but it was it's a bit odd. So we, we want to look a bit more into that and we want to sort of have a bit more refinement of the sampling rates for all three of these. So there's, there's still work to be done. But uh, the overall conclusion actually in this was that the MERP has showed the best um, performance. We had the lowest limit of detection, highest precision, best accuracy. And that's likely a lot of that is due to the higher sampling rate because of the design. So when you have a lot more uptake, your relative proportion of uptake to your blanks is, is higher and therefore you can naturally go lower. So um, we're really quite pleased, obviously, at uh, the performance of this system, and it gives us even more confidence to do this global sampling that uh, that I've been talking about, that I'm one day we'll get to results, hopefully. So just some final thoughts. Um, it just in the theme of things always brings me up to the Bob Dylan song, so that's always <laughs> been in the back of my head, but times are changing for everyone, and I think this is a year really of change. And I think part of that includes rethinking the way we do air monitoring. Uh, the global community is asking us for guidance on how best to respond to the policy questions and through our monitoring capabilities. So we are now being held to task and being asked our advice. And so I think, I think we're starting to effectively do that. 
Uh, there's new and less expensive techniques being introduced all around. We've been seeing that um, absolutely in this morning's talks. Um, not all these new technologies will answer every of our science question, but they can answer a lot of them in a quite a sustainable way. So I think we should all be considering, not all of us, but many of us, reliable passive sampling as a way in the future for monitoring. And with that said, that's all I got today. Great, thank you, Sandy. In light of all these changes, I appreciate your positive attitude. I have a feeling you're a glass half full person. <laughs> I've had to <laughs> this year, I really tried my best. <laughs> we have to, right? Yeah. Uh, if there are any questions for Sandy, I don't see any written in the chat, um, but if anybody would, oh, would like to um, unmute, you're welcome to do that. Hi, Christy, this is Russ. Hi, Russ. Uh, got back online, power's back on again. Um, uh, Sandy, I have a question. Um, you know, as a modeler, I'm really looking for, for data that's on a lot shorter time scales than what you're getting with a passive sampler. Would it be possible to apply some very simple uh, ventilation system and, and get the, this, this technology to work on maybe daily scales? Would you, would you get enough sample in one day? Um, I think it really would depend on the concentration levels. I don't even think you'd need uh, the, the carbon is really, uh, really good at pulling in the mercury there. So I don't like if you had really high concentrations. Yeah, I think you could do it on daily. Mm -hmm. I think if you want the daily, you might want to look towards what Japan has been presenting and what Dave has been talking about, because it's kind of like it's smaller than a tech gram. Yeah, and it's it's active sampling. Um, so it forces it through. I'm not sure how we would pump through the design as it is. I don't, but so I don't think the design can be altered to pump things through per se. I think daily would really push it unless it was a real contaminated site, but, um, you can't, because we have this high, high radial diffusion happening, there's a lot of surface area to, to pull the mercury into. So we can, I mean, the two week samples, you're going to get the better precision and better accuracy the longer you go. So yeah. you have to then work with your uncertainty um, if you want to have the shorter time period. But I think depending on the concentration, you could do a week, two weeks. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that's, again, it's, it's the question you want to answer. And then you apply the technique to the question you want to answer. Yeah, yeah, I was definitely glad to see you know what what Dave's got going there, and and yeah. you know, this this looks like this is a bridge to that. But I, and I don't know how much you know what the price of one of Dave's devices are versus one of these. So you know, a lot of questions, but it's interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. In the interest of time, I think we'll keep rolling here, but there is a question from Linwell Martin in the chat that I know you will address. Thank you. Our next speaker is May Gustin. May, do you wanna go ahead and share your screen? May is from the University of Nevada, Reno, and she'll be talking to us today about active and passive systems for measurement of gaseous oxidized particulate bound and reactive mercury. Oops. And we see your presentation. Hello, everyone. Nice to, yep, got it. Okay. Um, yeah, it's nice to see or hear everyone and get to listen to some Mercury Talks. So um, what I want to talk about today is um, active and passive systems for gaseous oxidized particulate bound and reactive mercury. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on the talk, uh, Sarah Dunham Cheatham, who works with me, Seth Lyman, Stefan Osterwalder, who um, Kevin sang many praises for, and I do also, um, Joey Wong, who actually worked for me as a postdoc um, in like 2012 to 16, and Lei Zhang from Nanjing University, who um, helps us with thermal uh, deconvolution of thermal desorption profiles. So just to remind everyone, um, 
In the air, we have gaseous elemental mercury. It's weakly water soluble, so it's not really what you expect to get in wet deposition. Uh, global average concentrations, one to two nanograms per meter cubed. It has a lifetime of an hour to, to years. Um, it's typically 95% of atmospheric mercury concentrations. What I'm gonna focus on is primarily gaseous oxidized mercury. It's typically divalent. It's highly reactive and water soluble and particulate bound mercury. Um, it's condensed, semi-volatile, bound to aerosols. It's primarily oxidized mercury. And then also I combine these two uh, in a lot of these slides and just describe that as reactive mercury or RM. So I just wanna point out, this is the TechRan system that people have been using for quantifying gaseous oxidized mercury and particulate bound mercury. Um, basically, air gets pulled through the, the system, and you collect gaseous oxidized mercury on a KCL denuder and um, particulate on a particulate filter. While these things are being collected, you measure gaseous elemental mercury. And then for a time period, you stop measuring gaseous elemental mercury, and you these two components of the system are thermally desorbed, the air goes through a pyrolyzer, converting mercury to gaseous elemental mercury, and you quantify gaseous oxidized mercury and particulate bound mercury this way. And I will be showing some TechRan da data. So I wanna make sure that you understand how the system works. So the system's being used in networks worldwide. Um, there's no ambient air field calibration for this instrument for gaseous oxidized mercury. It does not collect all RM compounds with equal efficiency. Ozone and water vapor um, affect collection. And there's been a lot of papers published basically saying this. The other thing is it does not really allow for assessing chem the chemistry of compounds. And I just wanted to point to one because here are our arrowhead passive samplers, circuit surfaces for measuring Dry deposition of GOM, we don't think it collects PBM. If it does, they're really small particles. And this is a picture of it being it deployed in Florida. We are also working on gaseous elemental mercury and GOM passive samplers for concentrations. We made measurements at three different sites. And basically I just have, and we use cation exchange membranes as the collection surface. And basically I just wanna point to some data that we collected during the study. So we had three different locations, outlying landing field near Pensacola, Tampa, Davie, which is over near Miami. And um, basically, I just want to point to these fine dots, which represent the model dry deposition using the Tecran GOM concentrations and the measured dry deposition using the surrogate surfaces. And in many, most cases, the surrogate surface GOM deposition is much higher than the model deposition for the TechRan that we're getting using the TechRan GOM data. And the other thing to note here is that it varies the, the difference between the modeled and the measured varies by location. And so some major takeaways that we had from this project was that the model deposition using the TechRan GOM was lower than that measured by the surface. It differs for each location. And we hypothesized based on this that there were different atmospheric oxidants and that these different atmospheric oxidants would also have different dry deposition velocities. So this was kind of where we started to, we had been kind of questioning the TechRan GOM measurements, but this even pointed further to the uncertainty in to whether the denuder was collecting GOM efficiently. So um, we then focused over time, of course, on the development of an alternate method for quantifying RM. And we used two uh, different types of membranes. We used the cation exchange membrane. And this is an active system where we're actively pulling air through the membranes. And the, these cation exchange membrane is used to quantify RM. It does not take up GEM and these samples are digested and analyzed. And we also have nylon membranes in the system. And we use these for identifying the chemistry of the compounds. It does not take up GEM. 
and these are thermally desorbed and we thermally desorb the ambient air samples and then compare them to profiles that we've developed based on standard compounds that we have permeation tubes for. And this is what the system looks like. We call it the reactive mercury active system. Um, we've upgraded it from what we've used in the past. And this is discussed in the atmospheric environment paper. And basically it consists of filter packs with two membranes and in some cases three um, so that we can look at breakthrough. And then we alternate cation exchange membranes and nylon membranes in these filter packs so that if a pump goes down, we are still collecting data. And then the air is pulled through critical flow orifices. So we maintain the flow at one liter per minute. So this is locations where our system has been or is being deployed. Um, what I wanna do today is just focus on showing you um, some data from Mauna Loa, uh, Nevada, and then Maryland. And then I'm gonna end with um, some work that's being compiled right now into a paper where we sampled at, Sval at Svalbard. And our system that was at Svalbard is um, moving to Amsterdam Island. So we're pretty excited about that. So just on the three sites, just a little bit of information, Mauna Loa, high elevation, pristine site. Uh, primarily we get free troposphere and marine boundary layer air. So we would, would expect chlorine and bromine compounds. Um, the UNR greenhouse is right next to a highway. So we expect um, oxide, nitrogen and sulfur compounds. We also have inputs from the free troposphere and marine boundary layer and um, these will be bromine chloride compounds. And then the Piney Reservoir site in Maryland is downwind of a coal-fired fired power plant, sorry, and we would expect nitrogen and sulfur compounds there. So I just wanna show you some of the comparisons with the Tecran data. So this is the Mauna Loa data, the dark color in all these slides represents the cation exchange membrane, the lighter color represents the nylon membrane, and the black line represents the Tecran data. And the thing to note, as you'll see throughout this slot, uh, throughout these different graphs, is that the nylon membrane is typically lower than the cation exchange membrane. It does not collect um, compounds as efficiently as the cation exchange membrane. And we really need to develop an alternate thermal desorption surface that's better at collecting everything. So what you can see here is that the cation exchange membrane is also higher than the Tecran, but not in all cases. Mauna Loa is when it's getting free tropospheric air, it's very dry air. Um, the Tecran was calibrated with a halogenated compound and when they first developed the instrument. So it's not surprising that we do get some good agreement because we don't really have the ozone or water vapor impacting measurements and um, because of the chemistry of the compounds. So here's the data from the UNR greenhouse. And what you can see again is the cation exchange membrane um, is much higher than the Tecran data. The nylon membrane and cation exchange membrane are a little bit more similar. This has to do with the chemistry of the compounds and how they're collected with the um, nylon membrane. And then this shows the data from Maryland. And again, here's the cation exchange membrane in Maryland versus the Tecran data. Um, and then the, again, the nylon membrane is lower. And we have um, a paper has been published on this. It's an ESNT paper and discusses why we, we see differences and things like that. So um, our main, main working hypothesis is that we'll have different RM compounds due to the presence of different atmospheric oxidants. And I'm in the sake of time, I'm only going to show you the data from the Maryland site. And um, so for this paper, we did 10 day back trajectories uh, using high split. And what you can see is the dark red represents when uh, greater than 25% of the air is below the boundary layer. Um, and so you can see here for this time period, which is in the winter, we have air coming in from the Northwest and also some air coming over the Atlantic Ocean and then coming into the, the field site. And this is the thermal desorption profile the black is the ambient data, and then the 
different colors are de deconvoluted. These profiles have been deconvoluted, allowing us to come up with um, the relative percentage of the different compounds. So you can see here that the different forms that we measured using the thermal desorption profile were bromine chloride, nitrogen, um, sulfur compounds, and a lot of it was nitrogen and sulfur, which is what we would expect because we're downwind of coal-fired power plants. And then this is a time period in the summer, and you can see most of the air is coming in from the over the um, Atlantic Ocean and also other states and coming into Maryland. And the de thermal desorption profiles for this, we have um, bromine chloride compounds, some nitrogen compounds. Um, but what you can see that's interesting here is a, there's a lot of organic compounds. And we think this is due to the fact that it's the summer and there's a lot of uh, vegetation producing volatile organic compounds that could then uh, form reactive mercury compounds. So we further improved this system, um, have a paper back with needing revisions from ESNT discussing um, this. We've added a polytetrafluoroethylene membrane in the front to help us maybe separate PBM from GOM. And I just want to show one uh, snapshot of data for that. So this is just to remind you, if we have a PTFE membrane in front, the nylon chemistry is GOM. If we don't have a PTFE membrane in front, the nylon chemistry is GOM plus PBM. And so what you can see, so on the, this graph, we have the date, and this is the nylon membrane with no PTFE in front. And this is the nylon membrane with a PTFE in front. So this is essentially GOM. And you can see that we get a you know, higher with the no PTFE because of the P PBM component. And you can see here, we're getting oxide compounds on both. This bromine chloride nitrogen compound doesn't show up on the um, nylon membrane with the PTFE in front of it. And here's just another example um, where we have a nitrogen sulfur compound that's not showing up as in the GOM component. So some really interesting ability to just look at trying to understand GOM versus PBM chemistry as best we can for now. So the last thing I wanna focus on is data from um, that we're collecting at Svalbard. And this is a, a large collaborative effort. And I need to just acknowledge that, you know, all our work has been funded by the National Science Foundation so you can see there's a lot of people that are participating in this project and Stefan's actually working on the paper right now and hopes to have it submitted before the start of the new year. Um, and you can see here are our surrogate surfaces and our active system deployed at Svalbard and it's got a tech, they have a TechRan system also operating. So what I'm gonna do is talk about dry deposition also, which I think, which we have modeled using the TechRan concentrations and also the active system concentrations. So basically here's some data for the, the site. And what you can see, the dark gray is PBM and the lighter gray is GOM. So you can see that they, at times, they do have a lot of PBM on the TechRan system. And then this is just the average TechRan over the two week sampling period and you can see that the TechRan system is much lower than the um, cation exchange. So the cation exchange membranes are in red. Oops, cation exchange membranes are in red. And then Jerome Sonke has used these polyether sulfone membranes that are different than that ours. So this is comparing Jerome's polyether sulfide membranes with ours. And so you can see that there's fairly good agreement. We need to do a little bit more testing to compare these. And then the yellow is our nylon membrane, um, again, being lower than the cation exchange membrane, but these being much greater than the TechRan um, measurements. And then here's the GEM data, because the other thing we were interested in doing was looking at um, mercury depletion events and what happens with the chemistry during depletion events. Over here, we have the, the 
deconvoluted thermodesorption profile data. And you can see that most of the compounds are um, bromine chloride, and we have a lot of nitrogen compounds, and then some sulfur and ox. Um, there's some met organic compounds, some sulfur, and a little oxidized. Um, the thing that's interesting here is we're trying to really figure out where the nitrogen is coming coming from. So that's a a big um, that's a big thing that we're trying to understand. But so just interesting data that we've got as part of this project. And then this is just to estimate dry deposition at this location. So remember I showed you, we have the arrowhead samplers and arrowhead is a GOM measurement. So you can see here's the dry deposition and this, the red is the cumulative dry deposition. And what you can see is the GOM measurements here, the cumulative dry deposition are higher than the RM dry deposition calculated with a model using the Tecran concentrations. And then here are the um, concentrations calculated using the, um, sorry, I had one thing written down. Smashed it up. Oh, I'm not be able to find it. Um, anyway, so, Okay, don't worry about it. Um, so you can see the model dry deposition using the active system concentrations, and it's much higher than we're getting with the, the Tecran data. And we basically used a modified version of Zhang's, um, Leeming Zhang's dry deposition model, and used an alpha beta equal to two, and a tundra surface. And for the cation exchange membrane that we set the resistance of the surface to zero. So just interesting. Um, so just some conclusions from that. The arrowhead sampler provides a measurement of GOM deposition. Uh, people are still using this method. Mark Sather just uh, published a paper on looking at dry deposition in the four corners area and seeing if it's gone down since the first time he had the arrowhead samplers out. Um, recent work using a calibrated dual channel system that Seth Lyman's demonstrated that the cation exchange membrane was able to measure mercury chloride and mercury bromide without bias. And this paper has just come out in ESNT. So we're feeling good that Seth has a calibrated system. He gets a concentration with his calibrated system and we get the same concentration on the cation exchange membrane. And his is a dual channel Tecran system with a cation exchange membrane and a, to scrub GOM and a pyrolyzer to get it TGM. And then this reactive mercury um, active system provides a fairly accurate measurement of RM concentrations. We get an idea of the chemistry of the compounds. We've come up with maybe a new way to differentiate between GOM and PBM. And then um, lastly, you can use the reactive mercury system measurements to calculate dry deposition within a model. So with that, I would like to acknowledge others that have helped make this possible, master student that worked on it and grad students, undergrads in my lab. And then Mark Castro uh, was the Maryland site. Winston Luke was the, the per contact person for the Mauna Loa site and helped us get data. Um, Seth at Utah and then the whole team of people at Svalbard. So with that, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you, May. Sandy, you had a comment in the chat. Do you wanna just go ahead and make that live by unmuting? Yeah, yeah. Oh, what, what exciting data, May. Um, but, you know, I'm always all about all this. Uh, I still, my heart is always in, in depletion chemistry um, and what's going on in the Arctic, so. Um, what, what, what I want to say is, well, there was one thing, one thing I had earlier was a question about, um, uh, sorry, where was my question? It was um, about just basically the, the particulate matter, like influence on the, on your surrogates, because you're saying there's a difference between different methodologies, but uh, how do you know for sure you're only measuring GOM on the, the surface? And I may have asked you this before, but I just forget the answer. Uh, we feel just based on like looking at turbulent um, 
transport to the surface. And Juan, or Joey Juan, um, worked on that. And we're pretty confident that it's just GOM, not particulate. There may be some fine particulate, but we don't think we get much particulate. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the other comment was, I, I just would love to, because seeing that you've done this at New Ellison, it would be mm -hmm. really cool to do it at Alert, um, because Alert <laughs> really has like just way stronger signals, and then we can differentiate the time period. So we have this time period where you've got this super predominant particulate mercury, and then super predominant GOM. Um, and so you can really differentiate the two. And then if we could do this sort of like a you know, comparison of a bunch of different techniques up there. I would mm -hmm. love to do that. I would just yep. love to do that. That would be awesome. So, okay, let's, let's chat. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Are there any other questions for May? Okay, May, thank you so much for, for being here and presenting your studies. We appreciate it. Sure. And we will move on. Uh, Chris Romero, um, will you go ahead and share your, your screen for us? Uh, so, Chris, oh, okay. I was just gonna, oh, Daniel, are you presenting for him? Yes, yes. I wondered, okay, very good. So Daniel will be presenting today um, on atmospheric mercury concentration dynamics over a temperate deciduous broadleaf forest. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Christy, and uh, sorry for uh, the, the mix-up. I actually, um, um, I wasn't supposed to present two pre presentations, but uh, my grad student, uh, Chris, um, uh, wasn't able to um, fill in here because of COVID-related lab closures and, and lack of progress. So I uh, put together a few slides of preliminary results. So it's going to be a, a short talk, not as detailed as I wished uh, we could, but I want to give you some insights of, of the, the work we're trying to do and some very preliminary results. So I'll be short, so it'll help us to catch up with the schedule again. Great, um, thanks. So this morning I presented some results of an annual flux measurement here at Harvard Forest. And uh, it's clear that uh, these are very technologically intensive types of measurements. And it's unlikely we're gonna be deploying these types of measurements across dozens of sites or certainly not hundreds of sites. So what we do have instead is we do have a lot of atmospheric monitoring stations and we've heard a lot of exciting new techniques uh, that allow us to look at seasonality and diurnality of atmospheric concentration patterns. So what we want to uh, analyze is if we reconcile these atmospheric concentration records with the underlying flux records, how much can we infer about the underlying fluxes by just looking at atmospheric concentrations? So hold on. Okay. Okay, so um, in 2007, uh, I published a paper where we actually compared the TGM concentration record at Mace Head with the atmospheric concentration at Mace Head, and we did the same thing here in the southern hemisphere at uh, K Point. And what we observed is that we saw a very nice seasonality of both the GM record and of the CO2 record. And being a plant ecologist, so I immediately thought about plant assimilation and uh, kind of looking at the keeling curve type behavior of TGM similar uh, to CO2. And in the Southern Hemisphere, we basically lack this seasonality partially because we have much lower land masses than in the Northern Hemisphere. So a couple of years ago, Martin Yiskra uh, led an analysis that did this very co comprehensively across many sites in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. And what he basically recorded is that when we look at the GM concentrations in the Northern Hemisphere, these are the blue lines, the seasonality here, they very strongly track the leaf area index or NDVI index, which is basically a measure of greenness. And if you add CO2 analysis on here as well, you see these very strong summertime depletion 
emission of GEM and CO2 along with leaf area index. So this works pretty nicely in remote sites in North America. It kind of breaks down if you look at urban sites as you would expect because you have local or regional pollution. So this kind of seems to hold true for very remote sites. It works pretty well in Europe as well. So again, this is a agglomeration of several stations here. GM showing this nice summertime seasonality in sync with uh, the leaf area index. So, uh, but because we don't have flux records at these sites, uh, the questions we wanna ask us is, are these seasonal behaviors of GM in fact related to underlying ecosystem uptake uh, at these sites or, or, or at some sites? Um, can we apply the same methodology to look at daily patterns, daily peaks and daily minimums? Uh, and uh, so what's the relationship between concentrations and fluxes on a daily scale? And then the overall question is, can we at least infer qualitatively about the directions of GM flux by looking at these atmospheric mercury records? And can we infer about the direction on, of the underlying fluxes? So we're using that flux record uh, that I showed you earlier this morning that we developed at Harvard Forest, and we are comparing it to our absolute mercury concentration observation that we measured uh, above this forest. So this is a two-year record where we have uh, fluxes starting about here, and this here just shows basically the seasonality of the GM concentrations already very nicely evident that it shows a summertime minimum here at this site at Harvard Forest. It shows a wintertime maximum. And then as we go into the summertime periods, we see minimum concentrations again. So we have a clear seasonality of atmospheric mercury concentrations. We can actually show the seasonality uh, by doing this type of graphs where GM is here on the y-axis and uh, on one of the x-axis here we have basically the seasonality and then on the secondary axis we can have the seasonality and what you can see very clearly is we see this very nice seasonality with the summertime minimum here at this remote site in the Harvard Forest. First summer, second summer is nicely repeated in the two uh, summer months. We also see some diurnality. I'm going to get to that uh, later on. So clearly when we look at this type of records, we have to be aware that it's not only about sinks, but it's also not only about uh, sources. So we can actually start to construct some windrows analysis, some pollution roses, and actually look under what meteorological conditions do we have a significant enhancement of atmospheric mercury concentration because of advection because of transport from some area. So here at Harvard Forest, we learned we have to be really careful when we look at southern wind directions because we kind of have the greater New York area and even uh, uh, Boston area that seems to lead to some contributions of regional pollution levels here at this site. However, if we look at the dominant west wind direction where we have most of our wind directions coming from, we are in a quite clear or clean air sector uh, at this site. So let's compare these concentration variability to the measured underlying ecosystem exchange that we qu uh, quantified by micrometeorological flux uh, methods. So I showed this graph before. If we look at the fluxes, we seem to have clear deposition in the summer month. Here's a flux record from May 19 to September 20, and we see to have neutral to emission fluxes in the winter. So the goal of, of Chris's work is really to quantitatively relate these two records, basically how much of the concentration variability that we see here at this site can be explained by the underlying fluxes. So at first look and at first analysis, we see that between 50 to 60% of the seasonality can be explained alone uh, by the underlying fluxes of this ecosystem. So of course, what we have to be aware of this is that the fluxes we measure are somewhat representative of a larger area because clearly atmospheric mercury is more of a regional signal than just a very local uh, signal. But in spite of that, I think it's, it's quite amazing that the fluxes 
track these concentration records so uh, nicely. So we're working on developing a multi-regression model that tries to really crystallize out the contributions of the underlying fluxes to this atmospheric mercury record. So the second question is, does this work on diurnal pattern as well? So if we look at fluxes we measured here at Harvard Forest, and for example, we show some diurnal pattern, we see in the summer a clear signal of daytime uptake of mercury by the forest uh, here in June and July of 2020. If we look at CO2 fluxes, uh, driven by photosynthetic uh, CO2 assimilation by plants, we see a very, very strong diurnality of these fluxes. So can we translate that or how does this translate into atmospheric concentration? Well, when we look at the concentration records at this site, what we basically see is if we look at CO2, CO2 seems to do exactly what we expect it to do. We have a very strong drawdown of concentration during midday, and this is very strongly driven by this photosynthetic uptake of CO2. However, if we look at di diurnal pattern or diel pattern of GM, we see that a completely different behavior. So we don't see the daytime drawdown that we would expect based on the underlying fluxes. Instead, we see a nighttime drawdown of concentrations and we see a daytime enhancement of GM at these sites. Now, one could think of, oh, maybe the kind of the photochemistry, the re-emissions of GM back into the atmosphere dominates these patterns, but that's not what our flux record shows. Our flux record actually shows that we should see a daytime minimum in concentration because even during the daytime in the summer, we have a, do a dominating deposition flux. So what plays into a role here is the boundary layer mixing. So what happens is that during the daytime, you're starting to have vertical turbulence mixing of the planetary boundary layer, and that actually brings or advects air masses from higher up in the atmosphere into the boundary layer, into the boundary layer that is depleted with mercury because of these surface uptakes. So it seems that on diurnal patterns, the relationship between the fluxes and the concentration clearly breaks down. And we want to explore actually, is there any statistical way we still can infer about these daytime uptakes that our fluxes uh, suggest. So on a side note at nighttime, actually uh, the nighttime depletion, we can relate that to nighttime uptake that we observe at these ecosystems as well. But clearly we cannot just use some simple linear regression between CO2 and GM because there's different mechanism related to planetary boundary layer mixing that act on these two trace gases. So our future work is uh, we now have a handful of annual data records of GM fluxes. So Kevin uh, uh, presented one uh, this morning and, and we have a few records over some grasslands over uh, in Europe. We uh, did, did some uh, records over the Alaskan tundra. So we're starting to have a, a few data sets where we have fluxes and concentrations available and where we can start to evaluate statistically these relationships between atmospheric concentrations and underlying fluxes. So that's work in progress and I apologize, we don't have much more work to present, but I do also wanna give a quick outlook of some other records that hopefully are coming online very quickly. We received funding to establish annual GM fluxes on two more ecosystems. So we're working on instrumenting a site, a salt marsh site in Massachusetts. Uh, these are some of the most uh, productive ecosystems in estuarine ecosystems that we know of, very high plant productivity. So we want to see if we can establish some flux records here in a vegetation rich uh, estuarine ecosystem. And we're moving into a forest site in Maine actually next week. And this is to compare the deciduous flux record we have at Harvard Forest with a coniferous evergreen boreal forest that's not in too far distance to uh, where we have that other record established. So that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. These are some really exciting data sets and I'm, I'm really glad you're able to join us today. Also look Thank forward you. to getting you involved in the Mercury Measurement work group. <laughs> okay. Are there uh, any questions for Daniel? 
Hey, Christy, I actually have a question for Danielle. Okay, go for it. Um, I am curious just with regard to your final slide regarding the comparison between evergreen coniferous forest and deciduous forest and mercury inputs between both and how the fluxes differ. Um, for instance, I suspect that, you know, greater inputs from an evergreen forest versus a deciduous forest. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think uh, that would be my expectations. I, I think there's a, a lot of work out there that compare coniferous fo uh, foliage with uh, deciduous foliage right. and, and, and the directions go kind of in, in different ways. But uh, clearly the evergreen forest uh, does have active leaf area throughout the whole year. Uh, mm -hmm. They may not be physiologically active, the needles, uh, during right. all of winter, but they would provide the surface area. So one hope we have is if we can use these comparisons to kind of distinguish between uh, stomatal uptake and non-stomatal passive uptake some more, and comparing those two data sets should allow us to at least get some insights into that. And yes, I would expect that the coniferous deposition would be exceeding the the deciduous deposition, but we'll, we'll have to see. I'm not sure. Then likewise, um, that's helpful, but would you suspect that then the underlying vegetation, underlying deciduous vegetation in the coniferous forest would contribute less significantly then to, to mercury inputs to the ecosystem or uh, that it would be a valuable factor to include? No, oh, I, I think, you know, I think what we're measuring here with these fluxes includes the uptake by the leaves. So, so we believe that the, the mercury that's being taken up by leaves constitutes much of that signal we see here on GM deposition. And uh, so, yes, we believe that vegetation probably plays a very dominant role in this transfer of GM to the ecosystems. Right. Uh, in and so even the underlying vegetation too, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Are there any other questions for Daniel? Okay. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you. And Chris, I saw that you're on. If you wanted to go ahead and start sharing your screen. Sure. Chris Beckley hey, with the EPA will be talking to us next on surface air mercury fluxes and a watershed mess balance in forested and harvested catchments. That's right. Thanks for the introduction. Um, you can see my screen? Sure can. Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, all right. Well, uh, you know, apart from the, the co-authors um, of, of the presentation, Colin, um, Eagle Smith, Mike Tate, and Dave Krabenoff, a lot of other people have contributed um, from multiple agencies to make this um, project happen. So I'll start off by acknowledging them briefly there and then um, get into the context for this project. So um, study takes place in the state of Oregon in the Pacific Northwest and uh, a very large uh, part of the land area of Oregon is devoted to forestry. About 25% is actively um, managed for logging. And this part of the, the country also has um, high atmospheric uh, deposition, uh, largely driven by um, the fact that it rains a lot um, in the area. And so we're interested in how this, this mercury coming in from the atmosphere is impacted by changes in, in the landscape from forestry. And people have been studying uh, the impact of forestry on, on mercury cycling for 15, 20 years. Many studies coming out of Scandinavia have, have touched on this and a few from, from the Midwest um, in the US and Canada. Um, and what makes this study a little bit unique from the others is that um, the logging um, that occurs in the Pacific Northwest is often done in very mountainous and steep um, terrains. And so um, this is, is one of the few studies that, that focuses on a, a really steep um, mountainous catchment looking at, at these impacts. So our study is part of this larger um, study called the Trask River Watershed um, Study. And we were able to tag on this mercury component onto this larger study, which was done in cooperation with the timber industry. Um, and it, it's a paired catchment study where 
there's um, these three main catchments shown here um, in blue, um, kind of orange and purple. And within each one of those catchments, there's these sub basins um, where one was logged and one was not logged. The unlogged area shown in the blue, ah, sorry, in the green and the red being the log area. So each one of these catchments has a sub catchment that where we have these paired measurements. Um, and we looked at multiple components uh, of the mercury cycle in, in this paired study. Uh, the first one was looking at fluxes to water. So all of the watersheds had gauging stations, um, had flumes constructed where they were looking at discharge. Um, and a couple of years back, we published a paper um, that focused, to, focused on um, those fluxes to water. Um, and not unsurprisingly, when you remove the, the trees, you increase the amount of discharge. Um, you, we also saw um, a subtle increase in the filtered mercury concentration. We didn't see a, 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 any change in the particulate mercury concentration from the harvested and unharvested catchments. But because of that um, large increase in discharge, um, the total mercury loading uh, increased as a result of the forestry operations. And then there's another paper that came out from the same area that focused on the impacts um, to the food web. And um, looking at everything from macroinvertebrates to salamanders to songbirds um, across the board, we see an increase in mercury concentrations as a result of, of timber practices. And a lot of that um, change is, is in the biota is more related to um, kind of basal availability of uh, food resources um, as opposed to directly correlating with um, changes in the mercury concentrations. And, and then the final part of this project, the one that will be the focus of this presentation is looking at the surface air mercury exchange. Um, and for this, we're using the dynamic flux chamber uh, technique to look at the fluxes, which is a pretty simple technique. Um, then the great thing about it is that it's, it's very portable and is, is good for being able to take measurements at one location for a day and then move to another location um, and, and uh, it, great for capturing spatial variability. And uh, so we take one measurement every 20 minutes and we, we measured at a single location for 20 minutes. And, it's, and essentially the way it works um, is that uh, you're taking the concentration of the air inside the chamber, comparing it to the concentration of the air outside the chamber. And so you can measure uh, deposition um, or emission of mercury from a surface using that technique. Now, of course, the footprint of these chambers is very, very small, and we're trying to characterize large landscapes with these. And so one kind of way in which we hoped to, to get at the representativeness of these is by doing all of our measurements in replicate. So we'd always have two flux chambers. Here you can see in the pictures, we have two flux chambers um, measuring. Um, and the, the point of this figure here, um, we're, we're showing surface air flux on the y-axis and the time of day on the x-axis and it is throughout all the data from the site. But the, the main point being that on each figure, we show the, the uh, replicate flux measurements um, in kind of darker, darker and lighter colors, um, the orange and, and the red and the light green and the darker green are, are those replicate flux chambers. And essentially we see the same trends in both chambers um, across all of our field data. And so if you know, we do a correlation between flux chamber one and flux chamber two, they're, they're highly correlated. So um, it, it, it helps us um, in, in kind of understanding the representativeness um, of these fluxes when um, you know, the footprint of the chamber is very small. So on to the actual results. So looking at um, changes over a 24 hour time period, starting out here, we have uh, the surface flux on the Y axis and the time of day on the X axis. And in the marker here, the, the dotted line representing um, whether it's deposition or emission. And so this is one example from one of our sites that was taken during the summer from one of the catchments. and. You can see that um, throughout the day in the forested ecosystem, it's predominantly deposition um, with a little bit of re-emission 
um, happening for just a, a few moments during the day, probably when uh, the sunlight happens to hit that particular patch of soil. Now, in contrast, if we compare that to um, the harvested catchment, we see a, you know a very different trend. Um, at night, we see um, you know deposition happening, but as soon as the sunlight hits the surface, we see this large increase in uh, flux going into the air. And not unsurprisingly, that correlates very well with, with solar radiation, which you know, has been shown in numerous studies um, that solar radiation highly correlated with surface fluxes, largely due to the role of solar radiation in terms of the photo reduction of mercury in that soil pool to make it the more volatile form that can be um, emitted. And of course, you know, here we see comparison, comparing solar radiation in the forested catchment compared to the clear cut. Um, and, and of course, you know, you cut down the trees, then you don't have the shade and you increase the solar radiation and increase the flux. So that's, that was the dynamics on a daily basis. Now let's look at it on a seasonal basis. So here um, is an example from the fall, and this is taking all of the forested data and averaging it and all the harvesting data and averaging it. And what it's interesting is that even um, you know, in the harvested catchment shown there in the red, we have net deposition occurring uh, during the fall month. And, and the reason is, is that you know, in the Pacific Northwest, even uh, in the clear cut, as the photo there shows, um, it can still be pretty um, socked in. We're, we're quite near the ocean at this site, so we can have that coastal cloud cover coming in there and not a lot of solar radiation. So net, net deposition in both the forested and harvested catchments during the fall, but then during the summer, um, we see this large uh, increase in emission happening from the harvested catchments, whereas the forested catchments are still showing um, net deposition. So lots of that, those are kind of looking at the, the meteorological factors that impact mercury fluxes. And lots of studies have been done on, on surface air mercury fluxes. And, and a lot of them have shown that there's a correlation between the soil mercury concentration um, and the amount of mercury that's emitted. Um, and in this study, we don't see that correlation largely because there really wasn't a, any significant difference between mercury concentrations in the clear cut or the forested catchments. They were both very low um, concentrations and weren't significantly different. So um, differences in soil concentration was not a factor affecting the fluxes. Another thing that people have seen in a lot of studies is that uh, the soil moisture can have a, a large impact on the magnitude of fluxes. And, you know, looking through the literature, most of those studies that have shown the impact of soil moisture have occurred um, in very dry soils that have then become wet. Um, on average, you know, moving from one or two percent soil moisture up to, you know, 10 percent soil moisture. And you can see this big increase in mercury emissions when you go from a really dry to a wet soil. Here, we didn't see that much variability even between uh, the fall and the summer. Our soils remained wet um, year round. It's just a, it's a very moist, uh, you know, temperate rainforest sort of location. Um, and so we didn't see any large variations in soil moisture and the subtle variations that we did see did not correlate with our fluxes. But what we did see in terms of surface characteristics that impacted our fluxes was um, we did see as the soil organic matter increased, we saw increased uh, deposition, showing that linkage between um, you know, the vegetation playing a role in accumulating mercury and also during forest harvesting, the removal of that organic matter or decrease in that organic matter um, resulting in an increase in mercury being released from a, from a system. And so this next uh, figure here shows um, still mercury flux on the y-axis, but on the x-axis, we're looking at the air mercury concentration. That's the air mercury concentration measured at the inlet um, of, of the flux chamber. So the air concentration only a few centimeters above the surface. And, and what we see for the forested site here is that as the air concentration increases, the amount of deposition um, also increases. And that makes sense. Um, and it's consistent with sort of our understanding of compensation points if, as the air concentration of mercury goes up, you should have more accumulation. And we see the exact opposite trend when we look at the forested, or sorry, the harvested catchment. Um, the um, trend is, is that when the flux um, goes up, when you get net emission, then the air concentration goes up, suggesting that those releases from the surface may be impacting the air concentration. And when we step back and we, we pool all of our data 
from our forested site of, of the air mercury concentrations to compare it between forested and harvested, we see that the harvested areas had significantly higher air mercury concentrations, which are probably um, driven by increased releases um, from the surface. So now um, just a couple more slides here, and this is gonna be combining the fluxes from uh, that go to water, the, the aqueous fluxes versus the air fluxes. And we had um, the water fluxes measured um, throughout the year. Um, we went out in every month. So we have these, and we have these monthly loads. Um, and so this is plotted um, over a year time period with month on the X axis and then the flux on, on the Y axis. And then the dark green being uh, the water flux and the light green being the flux uh, to air, which we didn't measure every month, but we scaled those um, over the year based on changes in solar radiation hitting the soil surface. Um, and the, the takeaway message from this is that, you know, almost year round, um, we predict that the forested catchment would be net deposition with maybe a slight period of emission um, during uh, September there. And you can kind of just see the magnitude of the two fluxes um, in general, um, the, the flux um, related to the, the air exchange is larger than the magnitude um, of the flux in the water. Now, very dramatic difference when we look at a harvested catchment. Um, the, the red line being the flux to water, the yellow or orange line being the flux to air, and we see that big shift from uh, deposition to emission. Um, and there's also, um, you know, while it, it jumps out that it's most dramatic, the difference between the air fluxes, we do see um, between this green line and this red line, um, a difference in the flux to the water too. And we were able to write a whole paper about the difference between that line and that line, um, the water fluxes, but it's obviously a much more subtle impact than what we see in terms of happening with the air exchange. So last slide here kind of putting all these pieces of the puzzle together. So here we have um, estimated deposition to the ecosystem happening. Um, this was just from a CMAC model um, run. Uh, we have wet deposition in the blue and dry deposition estimate in, in the gray coming to the forest ecosystem. And if we look at the, the forest, we see about uh, this being the 0.46 being the amount of mercury lost to runoff, which is about one and a half percent of the mercury coming in. And we have net accumulation um, from this surface exchange. So the, the, the forest is this large net sink of mercury. And then we switch to the harvested catchment. We see about a doubling of the mercury mobilized in runoff. Um, but you know, it's still only about two and a half percent of all the mercury coming in. We see the surface exchange in the yellow there going from a net sink to a, to a net emission, but still, um, when we look at the mass balance of it, um, even the harvested catchment would be a net accumulator of uh, atmospheric mercury, just a less efficient one compared to a natural forest. And uh, that's all I've got. Um, so I'll turn it over or turn it back uh, to Christy. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thanks, Chris. Really cool study. Does anyone have any questions for Chris? I don't see anything in the chat box. If you'd like to ask a question, you're welcome to unmute and, and ask. Can I ask a quick question, Christy, Daniel? Yes, please. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Chris, uh, nice, nice talk. Uh, I have a question about your correlation of mercury flux with organic carbon uh, in mm -hmm. the soil. So do you think that indicates some mechanistic or mechanism for forest floor GM uptake. So do you think that's just sorption to organic matter that's there? Or is there some active oxidation in those layers? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I don't know exactly. I mean, I would defer to your thoughts on, on what's, what's happening there. I mean, my kind of thought would be that the ones with the, the higher organic matter, you know, tended to be moss covered, you know, um, vegetated um, forest floor where we saw the more accumulation. And then the ones at the, the sites with the, the lower organic material tended to, to be devoid of vegetation. So I think that there was um, some, you know, the effect of this like active uptake by the vegetation 
that was was driving that. Um, would that be your interpretation of this also? Uh, I, th I think that's a very good thought. Uh, we often ignore kind of the non-vascular planes like the lichen and mosses, and uh, that certainly could, could, could be driving it as well. Okay, good to hear. Very good. Well, thank you, Chris. We appreciate it. Sure. And we are exactly on time. Way to go, people. Um, our next talk is by Mark Sather. Mark, if you're there, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. <clears throat> Mark will be talking to us about the comparison of pre-MATS rule and post-MATS rule GOM dry deposition measurements in the Four Corners area. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's noon uh, here in Dallas. And um, I'm really enjoying the Mercury presentations today. I'm going to give a, a summary uh, comparing uh, pre-MATS, uh, the pre-Mercury and air toxic standards rule, uh, uh, GOM dry deposition measurements that we took in the Four Corners area back in 2009 to 2011, and compare those to the post-MATS rule measurements that we recently completed from 2017 to 2019. And I want to recognize uh, co-authors of this presentation, uh, Shaibal Mukherjee from our EPA Office of Research and Development, North Carolina, and Luther Smith, a contractor uh, in Durham, North Carolina with uh, CERCO. So again, the purpose of our study was to do this comparison. We took the baseline measurements from August 2009 to August 2011, and then we followed up at the same sites uh, August 2017 to August 2019. Uh, significant actions that took place uh, over the past nine years. Uh, by December 31st, 2013, there was a permanent shutdown of three units at the Four Corners power plant. And then in April 2016, we had the national compliance date for all major coal-fired power plants in the United States uh, to have installed at least 90% mercury control that was required uh, by MATS. So uh, measurement data from this study was useful in assessing the effectiveness of these actions. And we conducted a, a statist statistically robust uh, hypothesis uh, testing, two-sided hypothesis test to make sure we were seeing uh, statistically significant changes, either increases or decreases. Um, I have a link there to uh, a journal article that, that gives the details uh, for, for the study uh, that is in press right now at Atmospheric Pollution Research. And um, you can uh, do the uh, click on that if you want to take a look at that. This is the same journal that, that published um, the first baseline study. So we have both studies uh, in this journal. I want to recognize the study team um, especially the uh, site operators uh, that did such a great job uh, for us. So again, we had our uh, region in Dallas. Uh, we also had our, our Denver uh, region, uh, Ethan Brown, EPA ORD, again, Shaibal uh, Mukherjee, uh, the New Mexico Environment Department. We had Roman Sakota and Kara Lopez, uh, U.S. Uh, Forest Service and BLM up in Durango, uh, Bob Brantlinger and Kelly Palmer. National Park Service, uh, we had Mesa Verde, Paul Bowman, Andrew Spear, and then at the Bias Caldera uh, National Preserve, we had uh, Robert Parmenter and Scott Compton. Uh, EP contractor mentioned Luther Smith with Circo, and then our subcontractor, Eurofins uh, Frontier Global Sciences. So here's a map of all of the power plants across the United States that were subject uh, to the MATS rule. And our sites were right in here in the Four Corners area. So uh, we were especially impacted by the Four Corners and San Juan power plants. Those are right here, the two very large power plants. Uh, we also made note of smaller power plants up here, the nuclear power plant and the Escalante power plant. Uh, but what's also of interest is uh, this whole area right here, because we're, we're looking in part at regional emissions. We have a lot of coal-fired power plants in the, in the Mountain West. 
On this slide, I uh, want to show where our sites were. Uh, we used the same six sites in 2017 to 19 that we did in 2009 to 2011. And up here, we're showing the uh, detail of the elevation. CO96, which is our Molas Pass Colorado site, uh, this is our uh, complex terrain, high elevation, and it's very remote. 3,249 meters above sea level. It's only affected by regional and global anthropogenic mercury emission sources, um, negligibly affected by local sources. So that enabled a, an excellent um, comparison of regional and global versus the other five sites right here that had some local uh, influence. So right here, we have Mesa Verde, CO99. We have Farmington Substation, which is uh, close to the, the two large power plants, which you can see in the columns, Four Corners and San Juan. We had a city site, NM99, at Farmington Airport. We had um, a regional oil and gas site, Navajo Lake. And then we come down here to the caldera, right here by his caldera uh, preserve. And then at the bottom here, I want to, to point out the population density. So um, we do have uh, the city of Farmington, the Farmington MSA, Durango, Cortez, uh, small cities up here. And then down here, the, the caldera preserve uh, is impacted by local sources from Albuquerque, Bernalillo County, quite a large area, about 900,000 uh, people MSA, and then Santa Fe and Los Alamos to the, to the east. Wanted to uh, give a picture of some of the sites. So there are three, uh, three sites here. Upper left, we have Paul Bowman at Mesa Verde. This was our highest GOM site. In year three, uh, we recorded an estimate of 11,542 nanograms per square meter uh, during that year. It's at 2172 meters above sea level. And during the four years of our study, 09 to 11, 17 to 19, GOM dry deposition represented 30% to 65% of the total deposition. Um, we had two sites, uh, Mesa Verde, and then CO96 is our Molas Pass site. Both of these sites also uh, took wet deposition uh, with the NADP weekly, weekly setups. So over here to the upper right, again, is our, our Molas Pass site, 3249 meters above sea level. The GOM dry deposition during the four years ranged between 14% to 27%. This was our lowest overall GOM site. Uh, year four, the last year of our study, 2,237 nanograms per square meter per year. Lower right here is uh, Bob Brantlinger. The Molas Pass, as you can see, complex terrain would often receive a lot of snow. So uh, hats off to Bob for uh, always getting to this site and always uh, making the change out. So we really appreciate that. And then finally, lower left, this is our Farmington Airport site, NM99, 1674 meters above sea level. You can see our setup. Um, Dr. May Gustin showed earlier the, the surrogate surface. That's what we used here uh, with the uh, arrowheads. So these are the um, Mustaine S membranes, polyether sulfone, cation exchange membranes facing down in the arrowheads. And we would take two week uh, integrated samples. We did have a few, uh, we had a government uh, shutdown. We had to weather um, during two, late 2018 into 2019. And so we took four week and six week samples. Um, we were very happy with the, the precision. We didn't see any um, degradation in, in the precision. So uh, we were still able to, to continue to get good data uh, from those four-week and, and six-week samples. 
Let's start looking at the data. This is a time series of the uh, contiguous uh, two-week integrated time periods for all four of our study years. So on the left, the le left first half, these are the, the first two years, uh, 2009 to 2011. And this is 2017 to 2019. We have all six of the sites right here. Generally, the spring and the summer of GOM dry deposition was greater than the fall and the winter. So that's right here in the first year, second year, third year, and fourth year. You'll see the, the highest values uh, for the, the GOM in nanograms per square meter. And again, these are, are usually two-week uh, integrated samples. You will also note that uh, CO96 molus pass, which is in blue right here, was notably lower for the GOM dry deposition compared to the other five sites. On this graphic, we show the uh, differences between the first two years and the, the last two years for the GOM dry deposition. On the y-axis, we have the annual arithmetic mean of the two-week integrated uh, GOM dry deposition estimates. We have the 2009 to 2010 data pictured here, the 2010 to 2011 data pictured here, and then we um, come back in the 17 to 19 time period after the Four Corners power plant shut down three units and we had the national MATS compliance date. And so what we, what we saw is a statistically significant decrease of the GOM dry deposition at Molus Pass, CO96, and that's here in the gold, the, the bottom site, especially in, in the 2019 data. And then we saw statistically significant increases in the GOM dry deposition at both the Mesa Verde site, that's CO99, this purple line, and then the gray with the Farmington substation. Now we also saw increases uh, at this green uh, site, which is um, the Farmington airport. The blue is Navajo Lake and the red is the Bias Caldera Preserve, but they were not uh, statistically uh, significant increases. Wanted to show in detail Molus Pass. This is a time series for all four of the study years. And on the X axis, we have the sampling period running from the 1st of August to the 1st of August for each sampling year. The black boxes are year one, to the 2009 to 2010 data. The purple circles are year two, 2010 to 2011. Year three are the open boxes, and that's 2017 to 18. And then the final year, the blue asterisks are 18 to 19. And I wanted to focus to, on this oval right here. This is early April to early July for all four sampling periods. And years two and four, so this is the, the purple, and then the blue asterisk right here, they had similar precipitation amounts in the NADP rain gauge, but vastly different amounts, as you can see, of the uh, GOM uh, recorded. We had um, about 1,000 in year two nanograms per square meter and about 400 in year four, so a, a, a great decrease. And we feel that, that this is largely due to the mass decrease uh, for the power plants, uh, decreasing their emissions. Uh, because in year three, right here, we were impacted by the fire. We had the Durango 416 and the borough large regional wildfires uh, going on um, in June and July and um, extreme drought, drought conditions going on right before that. So uh, that accounts for these three very high levels that we saw in 2018. But when we go to 19 and there's no fire, 
you really see the, the decrease right here. And it was nice to have that comparison with year two that had the similar precipitation amounts so that we could we we could tease out the you know the effects of the of the regional wildfire. Wanted to show this. We did uh, some high split uh, back trajectory analysis using um, the the NOAA high split uh, model. And what this shows, this suggests the importance of local mercury emissions from cities and oil and gas that's in the area. And also the importance of those occasional large wildfires. So this is June 20th, July 3rd. This was our, our highest GOM two week period at uh, Mesa Verde National Park, where we had over 1300 nanograms uh, per square meter uh, measured on the arrowhead. So what's shown here uh, during this two week period are six 48 hour back trajectories and 124 hour back trajectory. And I'm gonna focus on the inset up here. And so what we noticed was that none of the back trajectories went over the two large power plants. So Four Corners and, and San Juan, but it, instead, uh, we had uh, trajectories going through Durango, the Durango area, and also through uh, oil and gas area. So south, southwestern Colorado, uh, southeastern Utah, and also northwestern New Mexico. Uh, this area contains the San Juan Basin for oil and gas production, and this area contains the Paradox Basin. And so uh, it suggested that um, along with city local mercury emissions that we're seeing some impact from uh, oil and gas combustion sources, uh, either flaring or uh, refining uh, going on. It, it looks like that that's notably contributing uh, to the, uh, the GOM dry deposition in the Four Corners area now. And we also had the wildfires. So uh, uh, June and uh, late June and July, in this area, Dur Durango, right in here, about 15, 20 miles uh, north west of Durango, you had the large uh, Durango 416 borough wildfire complex. So it suggested that that was contributing also. So to summarize, the GOM uh, dry deposition rate estimate. Uh, decreased 25% at the Four Corners area high elevation remote mountain site of Molas Pass from 0 0.4 nanograms per square meter hour to 0 0.3 uh, nanograms per square meter hour. We saw a statistically significant decrease of 17 uh, nanograms per square meter in median comparison values. In contrast, we saw the GOM uh, dry deposition rate estimates for the remaining five sites all increase up to uh, a high rate of 1.3 uh, nanograms uh, per square meter hour. We found at two of the sites statistically significant increases. That was at Mesa Verde uh, National Park and Farmington uh, Substation of 66 and 64 nanograms per square meter respectively in the median values. And since recent publications, uh, such as uh, Streets et al, 2019, also the 2018 UN uh, Environment Program Global Mercury Assessment, um, since those publications uh, estimate that overall global has, has not decreased, and since local emissions at Molas Pass would be considered negligible, we do think that, that we saw the impact of the mats and the uh, Four Corners and San Juan power plants decreasing their emissions as likely accounting for the statistically significant decrease in the GOM uh, that we measured at Molas Pass in 2017 and 19. Uh, it's also suggested that local mercury emissions from the nearby cities and the oil and gas production areas in southeastern Utah, southwest Colorado, northwest New Mexico 
are likely contributing to the GOM in the Four Corners area outside of Moles Pass. And finally, um, the higher GOM dry deposition estimates that we saw at all of the sites during the June and July 2018 uh, Durango 416 and Borough Wildfire Complex suggest the importance of occasional large wildfires to GOM dry deposition loading in affected ecosystems. And with that, I will stop and, and take any questions. Great, thank you, Mark. I'll start with a question. Um, I assume that you are working with folks from the Four Corners Air Quality Task Force. I know folks from our office are involved in that and I wonder if they've heard your results. Yes, um, it, due to COVID, we haven't had our uh, annual meeting as yet, but I have uh, gotten that out, uh, such as to Mark Jones of the NMED who usually facilitates helps facilitate the, those meetings. But yes, as soon as we have a, a meeting, we will uh, give a presentation uh, on that to them. Great, very good to hear. Uh, there's also a question in the chat from Dave Krabenhoft. Mark, did you look at GEM pre and post mats as well? Did we? So it, let me see if I can see that. We, we did not. Um, as uh, Dr. Gustin mentioned earlier, the, the arrowhead is specifically set up uh, just to measure for GOM. So it does not measure for either PBM or, or GEM. So just, just the GOM. And another question, any idea why the Mesa Verde numbers are much higher compared to others? Is it due to forest fires you mentioned? Other sources in Utah, Colorado region? Also, are wind roses different in the Mesa Verde region? Yes, um, we, we feel that Mesa Verde is optimally located to be downwind of, of all of these sources. So it's, it's optimally lo located of not only the power plants, but the, the, the cities and also the, uh, the uh, oil and gas uh, facilities, both from the Utah direction and from the Colorado, New Mexico uh, direction. Very good. All right, Mark, I think we'll move on, but thank you for your presentation. Uh, Vivian, if you're on the line and wanted to share your screen, Vivian Taylor with Dartmouth College will be presenting next on tracing the depositional history of mercury to two coastal national parks, my favorite subject, in the Northeast United States. Okay, thanks. Um, I think I'm set up, so. Yep, looks good. Um, sorry, let's move this. All right, so um, this is a study of mercury deposition um, at two coastal sites in the Northeastern US. Uh, lakes have been established as robust mesh as robust records of mercury atmospheric deposition. But compared to other regions in the country, there's somewhat of a data gap along the Northeast coast. So there are a lot of, of mercury um, deposition records around the Great Lakes, um, probably because there's a lot of mercury labs there, but there's, there's by comparison, not, a lot, not as many along these coastal sites. Um, the, North, the Northeastern seaboard receives mercury from long range atmospheric transport from sorry, from industry in the South and the Midwest. Um, so it's a site of high precipitation and there are landscape hotspots throughout the, the region which make it um, an important zone for monitoring mercury. Our two sites for this study uh, were Cape Cod National Seashore and Acadia National Park. And as you can see from the National Emissions Inventory, um, most of the mercury that is reaching those sites is either from, um, like I said, long range atmospheric uh, transport and not from these um, these local sites. So our questions in this um, study were, what are the depositional dynamics of mercury in northeastern coastal sites? Is there evidence of recent changes in mercury flux in response to these to recent emissions restrictions? 
And what are the sources and processes driving mercury accumulation in pristine coastal sites and do they change over time? So in order to get a robust record of atmospheric mercury deposition, we need a few things. Um, one of the first is precise and accurate chronometry, especially in the recent years. So we want to be able to say um, in, these in these records of deposition, whether there have been decreases in mercury deposition since recent um, changes in legislature from the Clean Air Act, um, from the Clean Air Act amendments and from MATS in 2016. We also want ideal lake settings. So we want lakes that have no inlets or outlets and have a low watershed to lake area. So they have minimal disturbances. And we want to be able to measure, sorry, we want measures to understand sources of deposition and lake dynamics. Sorry. So our um, sampling designs was to look at two lakes in Acadia National Park, those being Sargent's Pond and the Bowl, and in Cape, the Cape Cod National Seashore, those being Long Pond and Dyer Pond. Our sampling strategy was to take two cores from each lake and to take two lakes from each site. And then we sectioned those cores into half centimeter increments and measured their ages by lead 210 chronology and established mercury fluxes as well as mercury isotope ratios throughout the cores. So the two, a good way to get a core, to get a good core is to, to, is to sample a site that's been sampled before. Um, and one of the sites that I looked at was Sargent's Mountain Pond in Acadia. And both of our Acadia sites are at actually quite high elevation um, for coastal sites. They're about 400 meters above sea level. Those are both fairly shallow lakes around three and six meters deep. Whereas in the Cape Cod National um, Seashore, we looked at one of the, or two of the, uh, the many kettle ponds in those sites. Um, kettle ponds have been shown to be good measures of atmospheric deposition because they're, they're not disturbed and there's not a big watershed input from them. And those of course are very close to sea level, about a meter above sea level. And they're also very close to the ocean. So about two kilometers from the seashore. Um, we sectioned the we sectioned and dried the cores, and then each of the um, the core sections was analyzed by gamma spectrometry. So each of those increments was measured by gamma spectrometry, and then the common way of establishing um, age down going down through a sediment core is the constant rate of supply is the constant rate of supply model, which is a standard model for lead to tangier chronology, where ideal deposition is assumed at the boundary layer. So we assume that if lead to ten is, is deposited at the center of the core, or sorry, on the surface of the core, um, that it just stays there and then material is accumulated on top. Non-ideal deposition is when there's penetration of the radio of radioisotopes through the sediment surface. And that's frequently evidence by a subsurface maxima that we see in, in lake sediment cores. Um, so on the left here, we see that there's sort of, this is from a, a core in Acadia, we see that there's a subsurface maxima of, of lead 210. And that causes issues when trying to establish an age model. Um, from a, mo from a, a more recent model of, of or age model for um, sediment deposition, uh, my collaborator, Josh Landis, used the LRC, which is um, a sh which is which uses the short a short lived radio radionuclide to correct for that sub for that subsurface um, maxima. So beryllium seven has a really short half life and is also atmospherically deposit deposited. So if um, the boundary layer were true, or if we only had ideal deposition, we would only see beryllium seven in the absolute surface sediment. Whereas in fact, we're seeing penetration of beryllium like down to about two centimeters in this case. And that means that there's not a deal de deposition occurring. So using the LRC model, we're able to back calculate um, what that penetration is and get rid of this subsurface maxima or the effects of this subsurface maxima of lead 210. So looking at our course throughout the lake, throughout the different lakes, um, both Sargent's and, and Bowl, which are the Acadia um, sediment cores, there is a significant, um, particularly in Sargent's, there's a significant um, subsurface maxima of lead 210, as well as beryllium 7 um, penetration in the surface of the core. Whereas 
in the Cape Cod cores, long and dire. There is not actually that much beryllium-7 penetration in the surface. What we do see at these two, um, in the two Cape Cod cores, is ideally we'd like to see um, a, an exponential decay of lead-210 going down the surf, going down the sediment core. Um, in the long in Cape Cod, there is some sort of a change in sedimentation rate or remobilization of the lead that's causing this sort of straightening out of the um, of the of the lead going down the core, and so that's also like a, a non-ideal um, behavior of radionuclides in the core. Another issue with trying to get good age models of the, the core surface is um, we often also, because by gamma spectrometry, we can measure other radionuclides, we often also use 137 cesium and 241 americium, which are the bomb fallout radionuclides as chronometers, because we know that bomb testing um, maxima in 1963 um, shows up as a as a strong peak in most in most sediment cores or in most um, most records of age. There shouldn't be any cesium-137 prior to that peak going down the core. Unfortunately, in New England sediments um, or in northeastern sediments where there's soft water and where there's not a lot of clay, the 137 cesium isn't um, immobilized efficiently. And we tend to see that there's some sort of a smearing of this of this maxima. So there shouldn't be any, prior to 1963, we shouldn't see any um, 137 cesium in the core, but it's fairly well documented throughout the Northeast that that does occur. Um, so looking at our cores for 130s for the, for the bomb fallout radionuclides, both Sargentson and Bull again have a fairly strong um, peak for 137 cesium, which is ideal for, for dating. It means that we can use that as a chronometer. And again, in Cape Cod, there's this actually quite bad smearing of the 137 cesium peaks. Um, and that may well be due to these ponds are quite sandy, the ones that we sampled down here. Um, and so there is, or there is obviously re-mobilization um, of both the cesium and the americium, which have quite different chemistries than the lead. Um, so mercury tends to behave more like lead 210, but this, this cesium is not really usable as a chronometer. So for the sample, for the lakes where we have a, um, a subsurface maxima of lead, we were able to test the CRS versus the LRC model. Um, and we found that ages of the bomb radioisotope maxima were in better agreement with the maxima of the bomb activity using the LRC versus the CRS model. So in the Sargent's pond where we had that strong um, subsurface maxima of lead 210, the age of the um, of this of this 137 cesium peak, which is in blue, corresponds with 1968, whereas by the CRS model, it corresponds with 1980. And so it gives us, oh, it's only one measure. It gives us a little bit better um, or more accurate ages of the top of the core. The other place that the um, LRC model seems to be effective is measuring the sedimentation rate. So sedimentation rate is calculated from the sediment weight of each of those 0.5 centimeter increments and the difference in age of each of each of those increments. Um, and so there's an upward curvature in the CRS model, which is likely a product of non-ideal deposition, which is potentially skewing recent sedimentation rates. So because we're calculating ages, which are coming out a little bit too young from that subsurface maxima of lead 210, we're seeing this, this skewing, which is likely not real. Why sedimenta sedimentation rates have potentially increased from climate change, it's unlikely that there is that much of an increase um, over the last few years, especially in northern Maine. Whereas the LRC models, model, which is in red, the sedimentation rates are sort of more straight up and down. And so again, it's a little bit of a, an indicator that those surface ages from the LRC model are maybe a little bit better. So finally looking at mercury. Um, on the left, we have mercury concentrations in the two, in two of our ponds, Sargent's, which is in Acadia, and Long, which is in Cape Cod. Um, in pre-industrial times, there is a little bit more mercury in Sargent's. Sargent's has um, more organic sediment. It's about 60% LOI versus sort of more 10 or 20 in the Long Pond. Um, 
both ponds increase, mercury in both ponds, the concentrations increase three, three and a half to four times, which is fairly standard from other studies of lakes. So that seems to be sort of a global, um, in agreement with global uh, data that there is from the time of pre-industrial until the sort of peak of industrialization um, or of, of mercury emissions, we see about a four times increase. And then in the Cape Cod, or sorry, in the Cadia cores, after about 1970, we st start to see a decrease. So following some of those um, emissions legislatures, there does seem to be a decrease in mercury. Whereas in the Cape Cod, we see the opposite. Things start to increase um, or things continue to increase as we go up the core to more recent times. There's also sort of a lag in the Cape Cod core where industrialization or increases in mercury emissions or accumulation from, um, fr from industrialization occur quite a bit later. So in the Sargent's Pond, they begin to increase around 1970, where, sorry, 1870, whereas in the Cape Cod Pond, that increase doesn't occur until around 1920. When we calculate those as sedimentation rates, the sedimentation rate in um, Cape Cod is much higher than it is in the Acadia Pond. And so that um, translates into much higher accumulation rates of mercury in Cape Cod. And the reason for that is likely more in line with lake processes than it is with a different regional um, emissions or deposition. So um, like I said at the beginning, ideally we want lakes which have very small watershed areas relative to lake areas. Um, and what the way that we look at that is, is just to, to measure those two areas and then take the ratio of the two. So the ratio of watershed area to lake area was actually, um, much with a little bit higher in Acadia than it was in um, Cape Cod, meaning that there is more potential for that for mercury that's um, been deposited into the water in the watershed to reach the lake. Acadia is also a little the, the watershed was a little bit steeper and there's a lot more organic matter. So those are all indicators that there is more watershed mercury getting to the lake. In Cape Cod, um, we, we're, tr we're trying to explain why there's, there's, why there's not a decrease in mercury deposition or accumulation in more recent years. Um, and so one of the possibilities is that there's focusing or that within the lake there is lateral movement of fine sediments or of, of the radionuclides themselves as well as mercury, which would cause that, that um, top of the core, the mercury in the top of the core to, in to continue to increase in recent times. And a way that we can look at that is to um, consider the lead to 10 inventory. So because the um, area of our, of our cores are the same, we should have the same amount of lead to 10 reaching cores no matter where they, they're taken. Um, there's not much variation in, in how lead to 10 or in lead to 10 flux from the atmosphere. And so we should have about the same lead to 10 inventory across, core, across lakes. Um, and it's a little bit higher in the Cape Cod cores, which suggests that those, those cores were taken in deep bowls in the lake and that there's likely some lateral movement of mercury getting into the cores. Cesium on the other hand, has a lot higher um, mercury accumulation in the Cape Cod cores. And so there's again, likely a differential um, accumulate or differential focusing of the cesium versus, versus lead. So now just looking at mercury isotopes, which tell us about the sources and processes to the lake. This is a very simplified view of um, how to interpret uh, delta 202 mercury. Um, so really negative delta 202 mercury is, um, is, is typically mercury that's coming from the watershed. So in pre-industrial times in Acadia, we have very watershed driven mercury. And then um, during industrialization, globally, we see this shift in uh, mercury 202 and sometimes 199 as well. And then things sort of stabilize around 1920. Cape Cod again behaves completely differently. I'm not really sure why there's a, a sudden decrease around 1820 to 1920. It may be um, increases from the watershed, uh, but then the, the sort of global pattern where we saw also accumulation, uh, increased accumulation of mercury concentrations kicks in around 1920 and then stabilizes 
Overall, the uh, core from Cape Cod is more in line with direct deposition to the lake. And comparing this um, to a recent study by Ryan Lepak and um, others from the USGS, which was looking at ro remote cores around, um, around North America. So in their cores, they found a regional trend where they found that cores from Newfoundland and cores from Minnesota and cores from um, Southeast Alaska look the same. If I consider my two uh, cores to be fr from the same region, then I think that there is a much bigger um, difference in lake effects on these cores. And also that this shift that we see in um, the Acadia core is much larger than we've seen in any of the other regions. CAP-189 is interpreted also, we can, we can say that slightly negative CAP-189, um, which, which isn't affected as much by sunlight um, or by photochemical processes, tends to be lower in watershed driven mercury. And so again, the, um, the Sargent's Pond from Acadia follows this trend of, um, of low sort of watershed driven CAP-199 in the pre-industrial times and then a big shift um, to industrial times. Whereas there's not like long or the, the Cape Cod core looks a lot more like direct deposition and shows no, none of the global increase with industrialization. So here um, compared to those other cores, Acadia is again, it looks more like Newfoundland um, in, in pre-industrial times and then goes through a large shift. Whereas in this case, uh, all three cores are sort of more similar to, um, to the coastal cores in the remote, um, in the remote core study. And finally, Delta or CAP 200 distinguishes precipitation from, gaseous, from mercury from gaseous emissions. And um, in, this, uh, in this study, there was not a big difference between cores, but there is somewhat of a trend in the Acadia core that looks like um, mercury is coming more from precipitation in recent times than from, from direct or from dry deposition. Um, when we look at this in isotope space of CAP-199 versus Delta-202, the uh, Sargent's uh, core or the um, the Acadia core, both, both of these cores are sort of extreme compared to um, surface sediments in the Northeast from the National Lakes Assessment. So the particularly pre-industrial um, Acadia core and um, the pre-industrial um, Cape Cod core are sort of outside of what we're seeing in other surface sediments in Vermont, um, New Hampshire and Maine. And so in summary, the LRC model was effective. It's the first time that we've tested it on sediments, um, but it was effective improving surface sediment age models where non-ideal lead 210 and um, where there was non-ideal lead 210 maxima and where um, seven, beryllium seven penetration of the surface sediments occurred. We found that focusing can have a large effect on the mercury accumulation of, of rates and it can potentially affect the recovery um, of, from decreased emissions. And finally, uh, lake effects in the coastal system seem to have large impacts on sources and processes driving uh, mercury accumulation and potentially bigger effects than the regional um, signatures. And so thanks to the National Park Service, um, to Brian Demento for helping with winter sampling and to Sarah Jansen and USGS for their isotope analysis and input on the project. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Oh, we've got a question. Colleen, do you want me to read or do you want to unmute? Oh, you can, or I can read it. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Um, so great talk, Vivian. It's good to see this. Hey. Um, I, you know, I'm, I might have missed this, but could the signature at Cape Cod suggest a closer connection to the influence of the marine environment than otherwise yeah. thought, you know? Right, it's a great thought. Um, Sarah Jansen had the same thought. So Cape Cod looks a lot more like like sea water, whereas right. um, Acadia looks more like there's more of the chlorides and bromides in the atmosphere causing oxidation um, in the atmosphere. And so, yeah, it could be. Um, at the same time, it's hard to get your like, yeah, it, it, the, the water's not that saline, despite how close it is to the ocean. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, thanks for that. 
And Sarah, would you like to ask your question or I can paraphrase? <laughs> sure, I also just wanted to say, I really enjoyed that and like the um, isotope aspect um, that kind of added a new dimension. Um, and I was just, it was just sort of an FYI. I was wondering if you had a chance to compare with Steve Norton who cored Sargent kind of over the past yeah. several years and I couldn't pull it up fast enough to see if it coordinated with what you found in terms of mercury. It does, so I mean, that record's great, but it also ends in the early 2000s. And so I sort of wanted to go back there and get the last couple of decades. Um, but yeah, our sedimentation rates and um, it, yeah, accumulation rates are quite similar to his. Um, so I mean, the, the, the record compares well. Um, I think we've seen a bit more of a decrease in mercury since the top of his core. Yeah, great. Good to see you. Okay, thank you very much, Vivian. Appreciate the talk today. And that will conclude our second session on Mercury today. Um, really impressed with all the talks, um, really high quality, excellent studies going on out there. And uh, in this Zoom environment, I, I miss the applause, but know that we applaud all of our presenters today. And uh, I'll just leave on a note that um, several of you joined us in the MELD Science Committee um, meeting on Monday. Um, this is a place where Mercury researchers can come to collaborate on a variety of topics. And if you would like to um, be a part of that group, please reach out to myself or Colleen Flanagan Pritz or Rick Hoiber or Dave Schmelz and we'll get you on the list um, for future meetings. So. Thank you very much and I will turn it over to Greg.